Hello, everybody. Good morning. My name is Riley Pickerel. For those in here that don't know me, and uh, I do get the honor of getting to preach God's Word. This morning, uh, we'll be continuing in the book of Luke as we're making our, our journey through there, and uh, we're going to be going to chapter 21 this morning. And uh, before we dive in, uh, let's go ahead and let's go to God and prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for a beautiful morning that God, as we get to see uh, maybe the start of spring this week as things get warmer, probably not because I'm sure it'll get colder, um, but God, it is nice seeing the sun out and seeing your world lit up and beautiful. And I do pray that as we go to your word this morning that we can also, uh, Lord, that there can be illumination, that it can light up, that we can see exactly what you want us to see in it. God, we love you so much. We thank you for this morning. We ask this all in your son's name. Amen. Amen. And as you guys are getting there, I will say, I do love it when I get to get up here and preach on a certain passage in God's Word that's, you know, it's clear and cut and to the point. This morning's not one of those uh, scriptures. <laughs> we're actually, we're going to be going to a part in Luke where it is it's probably one of the mo most nuanced and a little more complicated of most of the passages we'll read in Luke. Uh, and that is just because it needs a little bit of historical illumination. There's some things that from the Old Testament, most of us today, uh, being in our culture, going up in our day and age, we don't quite understand as well as the people in the first century. Um, but as we are going to be going there, uh, today's lesson is called Durable Words. Um, and as I was reading through this scripture and, and kind of getting the lesson ready this week, uh, it started to get me thinking about durable things in my life. And it started also to get me thinking about my car. And, and things like that. If you guys have ever heard me preach, my car is a reoccurring character and just about every sermon I preach. Um, and uh, recently, or as of recently, over the past year or so, my car has done certain things that have made me believe that maybe it's not as well built as I think. It's, it's built by a car manufacturer that is built tough um, but I've had several moments last week, not last week, but last year, uh, I was making a delivery for a woman, someone who was part of our Spanish-speaking ministry. She spoke Spanish. I did not. I was just dropping something off for her, but when I was shutting the car or the trunk of my car, the spoiler fell off in front of her. <laughs> it wasn't a good look. La <laughs> last week, I was driving down the road with a bunch of college students leaving the airport in Philly. Um, and as I was getting on the interstate, the, the mirror uh, just falls off uh, onto the dash. I told them, the car's fine. It works perfectly fine. <laughs> things just fall off every now and then. And, uh, and there are things like that. I think uh, part of the reason we spend extra money on things is we want things that last. We want things that are durable. That's why we buy Yeti drinkware or we buy a Garmin watches or you know, I don't know, kitchen mixers, like KitchenAid. That's like the Rolls Royce of all the, the kitchen appliances. Why do we buy it? Because it lasts. Callahan Auto Parts with the guarantee on the box. That's, that's a fictional thing. That's not real. It's from the movie Tommy Boy. But we invest in things that last a long time. Um, we also, we stop at the $5 rack at Target every now and then because things are shiny over there. Those things don't <laughs> last. But we all do it. We all get distracted. And then the story today, we're actually going to come across the disciples getting distracted by something that Jesus is going to redirect. Um, he's going to redirect their thoughts and, and use that as, a, as kind of a teaching lesson. So let's go to the scripture. We're going to be in Luke 21, verse 5. And it reads, some of the disciples remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said to them, As for what you see here, a time will come that not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. And teacher, teacher, they asked, when will these things happen? Uh, and what will be a sign that they are about to take place? Te uh, Jesus here, I'll pause right there. He's talking about the temple. Um, he's, he's kind of, they're seeing the temple, Herod's temple at the time, which over the course of, of the history of, of God's people, the temple, you know, it, it was destroyed, it was rebuilt, there was several moments where it wasn't up, and at this point when Jesus is on the scene, uh, we have what's called Herod's temple. Uh, I think Kurt even preached on it a little bit at midweek, he touched on it, and this was probably one of those lavish and in, incredible, it was an, a wonder of the ancient world. It's kind of like if you go to New York City. If you see the Empire State Building, you can't really stand in front of buildings like that and not be, wow, like this is, someone built this. This is incredible. Herod's temple was like that. One interesting thing about it is that before you enter the temple, there was two 40-foot pillars that were made of solid granite. Like there was no cutting. 
Like it was a true wonder of the ancient world. And the disciples were looking at it and uh, being amazed. And Jesus redirects their, their thinking. And this is where the scripture gets a little bit more dicey. As we keep reading, things aren't going to seem as, as clear as this part. Well, let's keep reading. I'm going to add some historical context in. But it says, he replied, watch out that you are not deceived. For many will come in my name claiming that I am he, and the time is near. Do not follow them. Uh, when you hear of wars and uprisings, do not be afraid. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines, pestilence in various places, and fearful events and great signs from heaven. But before all of this, they will seize you and they will persecute you. They will hand you over to the synagogues. They will put you in prison. You will be brought before kings and governors, all on account of my name. And you will bear testimony to me. But make up your mind beforehand not to worry how you will defend yourself. For I will give you the words and wisdom that none of your adversaries would be able to contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents, by brothers and sisters, relatives and friends. They will put some of you to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but not a hair on your head will perish. Stand firm and you will win life. So what Jesus is doing here, what he's going down, he's describing essentially what things are kind of going to go down between that time and the time that the temple will be no more, when every stone will be thrown down. And, and we actually, and this is part of why the word of God is so cool, we see all of these things happen. If you look at the book of Acts, as you read this part, you can kind of see, whoa, this, this sounds like Paul's life. This sounds like the disciples' life as they are brought before, uh, before kings, again, before the synagogue. And, and what's cool here, too, and I think this is kind of like a side point that we will kind of go down today, is um, difficult times, times of persecution, times that are hard, God sees them as times to give your testimony, as opportunities, almost like these heavenly uh, appointed times to actually bear witness to God that even through things like that, you'd be able to tell your story, and it's actually from a heavenly perspective. Wow, that's God's appointed time for you to actually stand up and, and say something for him. Very cool to see that. Let's keep reading, though. It says, when you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that the desolation is near. Then those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those in the city get out, and let those in the country do not enter the city. For this is the time of punishment and fulfillment of all that has been written. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. There will be great distress in the land and wrath against its people. They will fall by the sword and they will be taken prisoners, uh, as prisoners to all nations. Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the time that the Gentiles is or are fulfilled. There will be signs and sun, moon and stars. On the earth nations will anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. People will faint in terror, apprehensive uh, of the coming or what is coming on the world. For the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At this time, they will see the Son of Man coming in cloud in power and great glory. And these things will begin, or when these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. He told them this parable. Look at the fig tree, all the trees and all the trees. When they sprout leaves, you can see uh, for yourselves and know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And we'll stop there, because that's, that's the, the point of today's lesson, is heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. These, this whole scripture, what Jesus is essentially talking about, is he's talking about the end of the age, of, of the Jewish age, the temple system. That from the time of Moses, when, uh, when God set up the temple system in Jerusalem, to then, it was all looking forward to a, a brand new covenant. It was never the actual solution that Jesus, someone coming, a Messiah, was always the plan for God. And so Jesus is describing that the, this is the day, this is the time where God's, God's wrath, the God ending this old temple system, that it is coming soon. It's... And as we see, the disciples, they're impressed by the ancient temple, the, the, every, everything that was there. And, you know. But what's very interesting, and this is the big point I think Jesus is trying to get across to his disciples, um, is that that temple will be outlasted by those who choose to live their life and build it on God's words. 
and the building on Jesus' words. This is why the, the story, even before this, where you get the, the, the widow who puts two copper coins into, into the temple treasury, and Jesus pays attention to it. He says, hey, she's given more than every other person, people who are giving out of their wealth, out of their abundance. He says, no, this widow has actually given more. What Jesus is kind of doing and what Luke wants the audience to see is that this widow, by her life and her actions and what she's doing, she's going to outlast the very temple itself because her life is being built on something that will never pass away. Unless you build on Jesus' words, unless the, the scaffolding of your life, the, in, the interior of that, there's no amount of gold plating, outward adornments, or anything like that that will ever help it last longer. It will, like the temple, eventually crumble unless your life is built on Jesus' words. You know, there, um, if there are any words or book to really invest in, it's the Bible. It's, it's Scripture. It's God's words. Uh, and the you know, Scripture is amazing for many reasons. I think here's a couple of reasons. Um, this very passage that we are reading in Luke, there's some, like, pretty amazing kind of predictable value that Jesus is doing right here. Because all these things, even when Luke was writing them, that the temple would one day pass, it would be destroyed within a generation, it hadn't happened yet. Uh, the book of Luke was written around 60 A.D. Um, so what that means, and the temple was destroyed in, in 70 A.D. Um, so what that means is that what Luke was writing, like, it hadn't happened yet. Like, this was, by the time that it did happen, people within that generation, they knew Jesus kind of called this out. So Jesus kind of like Babe Ruth this. Like, he kind of called his shot, and, and, he, and it was written down. And he's like, within this generation, this is what's going to happen. There's some major predictable value there. Like if, you know, someone was, if Jesus was around and he made a call like on, you know, like a sports book or something, everybody would be putting their money on that sports book. Because what Jesus said here was so profound and so accurate in the history. So why God's word is amazing is that it just doesn't, or it doesn't just uh, speak of spiritual matters, speak of things that last, but also it's, it's within history. It actually intersects with things that we know from history uh, in a way that really no other book does. So some, a little bit of historical perspective, too, on this, because some people will write, well, maybe Luke was written a little bit later. Maybe it was written after the temple. So they kind of added those words back and said Jesus did it. So one, one major thing that most historians will say is that's just not how mythology works within, within books, within ancient literature. An example, uh, Alexander the Great. He was one of the great conquerors. Uh, he was a Greek he was someone who, at the, at the time when he was living, he had conquered the entire known world. Um, quite a feat. <laughs> so he was a big deal. And he was written about, about 500 years after his biography was written, about 500 years after he was actually alive. Um, that biography was very accurate. It's very historical. People will kind of look at it and say, like, yeah, these things are, are very acceptable. We see mythology creep into his, his biographies about 1,000 years after he left. it was alive. Now, what's cool about Luke is that these things that Jesus said, and then the, the times the event actually happened, the fall of Jerusalem, was only 40 years, which is amazing. Like, there, there is no other book or any, really anything like, like that in history. What's cool here is that 40 years is also a very significant number. Um, we kind of think of a generation in our day, like Gen Z, Millennials, Gen X. It's like maybe a 20-year gap, but it's not really. There's no set time. It's more of like a culture, like the culture shift shifts a little bit. Uh, for them, the number 40 was the number of a generation. You kind of think, how long did David rule on the throne? It's 40 years. How long did King Saul rule? 40 years. How long was Israel in the desert? 40 years. They were, they were there. So, and what's amazing, Jesus starts his ministry in 30 A.D., the temple was destroyed. All these things that happened um, that he predicted was 70. It was almost, it was 40 years exactly that within a generation. The predictable value is pretty amazing here. Uh, it's something that we, we see in the Bible. It's very cool. And also it's something that the Bible, and one of my friends uh, likes to describe the Bible as a tiger. You don't put a tiger in a cage to protect it. It can protect itself. It can, it can, you don't need to protect the tiger. The Bible is like that. It will protect itself in every way. Um, and there's also some very cool things of grace. I think that um, what was written about all through the Old Testament, whenever you study out the prophets, you're always going to get this kind of day of redemption, the day of the Lord um, that is, is coming. 
very soon. And what's very cool is that even Jesus, or not, not just Jesus, but God, um, from the time Jesus does die and the temple system is ended, you get, you know, 35 to 37 years. There's no quick sort of judgment. I think it's God so loved the world that he, he wanted to give everybody an opportunity here. I think that you see in the story there's some amazing threads of grace here that God wanted his people to give him every opportunity to see Jesus, to hear his words, and then choose which one am I going to invest in? Am I going to choose Jesus? Am I going to follow him? Or will I keep up in my old ways, the old temple system? Which one will I choose? This is the choice he was giving. And Jesus was trying to get his disciples to focus on real things too, on real things that truly last. Sorry, I'm going to take a sip because my mouth is a little bit dry. <laughs> um, and these things are very also similar to, this is a very relevant illustration in my life, to planning a wedding. <laughs> if you don't know that uh, right now, I'm planning a wedding. And, uh, and there's a lot of things that you can think about with planning a wedding. There's lots of details and things that you can think about. There's, you got the ring. It's very shiny. It's, it's a beautiful object. It's a great symbol, but also... At the end of the day, a ring is, is an object, is, is a piece of metal and diamond. The wedding day is also, it's also going to be full of details. Is there going to be a DJ? Is it going to be a band? What kind of food is going to be there? What's the venue going to look like? Is there enough parking? How many people are we going to have? There are so many details. The average wedding also today in America costs about $28,000, <laughs> which is pretty insane. Um, there, there are some pretty crazy things, and most of it's market-driven, let's be honest. Like the wedding system, it, it's, a, it's a big market. Like that's how people make money. But the only real thing that you need on a wedding day is a bride and a groom, and then a witness, somebody to, to pronounce them, bride and groom. And that's really it. Like those are the only two things you need. What's the truest thing, the most lasting thing happening on that day is when God takes those two people, intertwines them with himself to make a cord of three, and it forms a bond and makes something that the entire universe can't separate. But he forms to one thing out of the, what, who's coming to him. It's pretty amazing. That's the point of the wedding day. It's the union of a bond that's going to, you know, there's nothing in the universe that can separate it. But what about the DJ? What about the appetizers? What about all these kind of things? How much brick is too much exposed brick in, in the venue? There are so many things. It's so easy to get caught up in things. At the end of the day, they will pass. This is what it's like for us today. There, there are many shiny things that we can invest time, energy, money into. Just like a couple planning a wedding, they have a finite amount of time and resources to do it. So it is with us in our life. We have a finite amount of time, a finite amount of energy. And the question is, and this is what Jesus brings to his disciples, is where will you choose to invest it? Will you invest in my words and things that will never pass away? It's also kind of crazy to think about. Never? Like ever? Things that will never pass away, or you choose the shiny, the things that you see right in front of you, the convenient the $5 section at Target that's right there at the door, it's easy to walk into, which one will you choose? The section of scripture, I think it's very also easy to run through it, and we kind of just get the impression, it's like, oh, Jesus is coming back, I gotta repent soon, um, you know, you kind of get like the, the impression of this guy just standing on the street corner, and it's like, repent, the end is near, it's like, no, that, that's not what the scripture is talking about, Jesus knows what's, what lasts, he knows what, exactly what we need, and he's pointing us to that. He also knows the things that we need to stand the test of time on, on earth. The, you know, things are never perfect. There's going to be wind and waves. There's going to be dark nights. He knows what we need to make it through and stand. To be able to stand up on the last day, to put your head up and stand on your feet. He knows that. There's, there's an interesting billboard that I pass almost every day when I get on 22. That is for a university, and it says to future-proof your career. And I kind of laugh every time I see that. I was like, can we ever do that? Can you ever future-proof your career? It's like you never know what life, what kind of turns that it's ever going to take. And that's the promise that Jesus gives. When, when you choose his words to build from the inside out with a scaffolding of his words, you do future-proof in your life from this life into the next when you choose to trust him. Let, let's keep going in the passage because then Jesus says one more thing. He says, 
be careful in your hearts, uh, or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and anxieties of life. And that day will close on you suddenly like a trap. For it will come on all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always on watch. Pray that you'll be able to escape all that's about to happen, and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Each day, Jesus was teaching in the temple, and each evening, he went out to spend the night on the hill called the Mount of Olives. And all the people came out early in the morning to hear him at the temple. I think something so interesting is that we can, I kind of wonder, how did Jesus do it? He would go into the city every day. There was people trying to catch him in his words. He was, there was persecution. There was guys that were trying to literally kill him. Like, there was a mob trying to put him to death, um, trying to catch him in his words. How was he able to keep going in, to keep doing God's will? And it's because he went out every night to be with his God. He spent with the Lord every single night. I think that when we make decisions to choose to, to make time, to sit down, to be with our God, we're going to reflect him wherever we go. I think this is why, and this is a constant theme in, in Luke, he says, watch and pray. Prayer is a massive thread that you're going to get all through the book of Luke. Why? Because we need it. We need that time with the Lord to sit down to be with him. How do we not let our hearts be weighed down by life's anxieties, by life's escapisms? It's watching and praying. Choosing to, to do work for God that's not nourished on a deep interior life with God will always leave you wanting. I'm going to say that one more time, that doing work for God that's not nourished by a deep interior life with him will always leave you wanting, that you'll never be able to continue God's word. The temple is shiny, it's put together on the outside, but unless it's filled with God's words, with Jesus, it will one day crumble. I will say, too, I think an interesting point that if you're too busy to be with God, to, to spend time with him in his word, then it's, uh, that's what eternity is. <laughs> you spend your whole eternity with God. That's what eternal life is, to be with him. Um, you know, car companies don't give suspensions to cars just in case you hit a pothole. Um, you're going to hit a pothole. <laughs> there will be bumps in roads. Um, if you drive on 22, you know that it's going to come. That's why they put him on there. And that's why God gives us his words, because it's the only thing in this life that will never pass, that we'll be able to get through. Truly, I tell you, another, Luke says this in another place, in Luke 18, 29, you don't have to turn there, but you can listen, that truly, I tell you, Jesus said to them, no one who has left home or wife or brother, sister, parents, or children for the sake of the kingdom will receive or fail to receive much more in this age and in the age to come. That these promises aren't just for this world, to get us through life now, but they are for the world to come. Kind of bringing all this in for a close, that we have, um, there are going to be great times of stress, of, of persecution. Jesus promises these things, that they will come, as, as he was talking about. And if we're going to be prepared to not shrink back, to always go into the city, to use these times as a platform, to tell our testimony, we must be spending time with God these sacred moments outside the city. I think that let's just, in this week, let's choose to find time. How can I be prepared to go out into the city, to go out into the world? Uh, what can I do to spend that sacred time with God on the hill, to make that a priority because it does have promises for this life and the one to come? With that, uh, that's all the sermon I have this morning. Um, thank you guys. I'm going to invite worship to come back one more time uh, to close us out.